Welcome to Eggs and Issues, a monthly business program presented by the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. Listen weekday mornings to Ken and Matt on the WGAN Morning News. Eggs and Issues is supported by presenting sponsors, Bank of America, Martins Point Healthcare, and Unum, in cooperation with Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, Oxford Networks, and WEX. And now, please welcome Portland Community Chamber of Commerce President, Jack Lufkin. Never have I disappointed so many people (laughs) so quickly. Welcome, welcome. My name is Jack Lufkin, and uh, I am the volunteer president of the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce. Uh, As many of you probably know, Quincy Hensel is serving as our interim CEO. Uh, I can tell you that the the advertisement for our permanent CEO hit the, um, hit the, the wires this week, and there is a robust search uh, underway. But in the meantime, Quincy is doing a fabulous job for us. So uh, there she is. <laughs> a very important meeting here today, and I'm so very pleased to see so many faces uh, in attendance. Um, today we're uh, going to focus on innovation in the Portland waterfront with specific uh, regard to the proposed cold storage facility. We're pr- pleased to welcome both Bill Needleman, who's Portland's waterfront coordinator, and John Henshaw, the executive director of the Maine Port Authority. We'll hear from them in uh, just a couple minutes. Um, as is our custom, we would like to begin our program by thanking our sponsors. These are the folks that make it possible for the Portland Community Chamber to bring you the, uh, the excellent topics like we have here today. Uh, the first uh, for our presenting sponsors, we have Bank of America. Martins Point Healthcare, Unum, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, WEX, First Light, that's formerly Oxford Networks, uh, and our reception sponsor is Clark Insurance, KeyBank, IDEX, our parking sponsor is CV and Mahar Engineers, and you are becoming accustomed to the fantastic team at Headlight Audio and Visual, who supports us all for this program. Um, We also want to thank uh, Time Warner Cable's digital service video on demand. Uh, That broadcasts eggs and issues each month, and you can watch it whenever whenever you want, and uh, very much appreciated to them. Uh, Our print sponsor is The Forecaster. Our e-media partner is Main Biz. And our radio sponsor, who interviews our speakers and broadcasts live every month is WGAN. Uh, WMTW TV serves as our broadcast partner. Uh, and we also want to thank our special community partners, Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, the Bangor Daily News, the University of Southern Maine, and Oxford Casino. A very important component of Eggs and Issues is also our uh, Tomorrow's Leaders and Entrepreneurs program. And we thank AAA of Northern New England and Springborn Staffing for their support of that. That allows uh, area high school and college students to attend Eggs and Issues free of charge. Today, we're very pleased to have students from Kaplan University, University of Southern Maine, and the University of New England. <coughs> Excuse me. Today, we have sort of a special treat. We have, uh, uh, today, we have uh, academic deans at USM and Reykjavik, Reykjavik University. Uh, the USM deans are hosting their colleagues from Iceland over the next two days as part of a continuing effort to forge a close and enduring and productive partnership between the institutions that provides our students international experience in areas important to our respective economies. Uh, The Reykjavik University deans will spend the day visiting USM faculty and staff and several members of the business community. Tomorrow, the deans will spend the entire day with several faculty, staff, and the USM deans in developing a framework for joint research and academic programming that address the needs of our external communities. This framework will guide faculty at both both universities during the summer in developing implementation plans for clusters of interdisciplinary joint research and academic programs, which will be finalized this fall. Please join me in welcoming our friends uh, from uh, Reykjavik uh, and USM and all of the tomorrow's leaders. If you would please stand so we could welcome.
We also wish to thank Baker Newman and Noyes, sponsors of our Community Corner Program, which allows area nonprofits to promote their organizations at eggs and issues. Uh, this month, we are very pleased to have the Center for Grieving Children. Uh, the center is uh, celebrating 30 years. Based in Portland, Maine, the center is an oasis of loving support for children's teens and their families and others experiencing loss and grief. The center offers families free service made possible because of trained, dedicated volunteers, many of whom I suspect are in the audience right now. Uh, the center offers bereavement peer support groups in Cumberland and New York counties, tender living care for families living with serious illnesses, and intercultural peer support for children resettled in Maine <clears throat> from countries experience war or natural disaster. Last year, 586 children, teens, and adults helped one another through these programs. The center also provides training, education, and crisis support in schools, workplaces, and other sites across the community. Last year, over 2,100 individuals at 130 institutions benefited from these services. We encourage all of you to get involved with the center from liking uh, the center on Facebook, sharing information about their services, volunteering as a program facilitator uh, at their office at certain events, uh, or making a donation. And we hope that you will connect with uh, the Center for Grieving Children. Uh, personally, about five years ago, I know my family had a tragedy and they, they were there for them as well. And I want to send a personal um, uh, thank you to them for that. Uh, today we have Annie Haros and Kimberly Samard. If you would stand and uh, be recognized. A very important part of the uh, chamber is uh, recognizing those new members who have joined. Um, if there are new members in the audience, we would love to see you stand. We're going to put the uh, the logos of everyone on the, uh, the screen. Any new members here today? One in the back, a little, <laughs> thank you. And now on to our presentation. Uh, just a little bit of background. John Henshaw is the executive director of the Maine Port Authority and director of ports and marine transportation for the Maine Department of Transportation. In this capacity, he invests in, develops, and maintains port and intermodal infrastructure and markets that infrastructure to shippers, carriers, and the cruise shipping industry to the economic benefit of the state and its businesses. He oversees the Maine Pilotage Commission and the Cruise Maine Coalition, Maine's cruise ship marketing program, and co-chairs with the U.S. Coast Guard, the Maine New Hampshire Port Safety Forum. The Maine Port Authority operates the International Marine Terminal in the Port of Portland, Maine. Bill Needleman is the city's first waterfront coordinator. Uh, starting this position in 2014 after working 14 years with the city's uh, Planning and Urban Development Department, a former colleague of mine. Um, what, while with the city, he has worked with numerous waterfront projects, uh, transportation, uh, planning processes, small development permits, neighborhood scales, master plans, and citywide policy initiatives. Signature projects in Bill's portfolio include the Eastern Waterfront Master Plan, infrastructure planning for Ocean Gateway International Marine Passenger Terminal, redevelopment planning for the city-owned Main State Pier, and the Portland Peninsula Traffic Plan, mixed-use policy and zoning development for the Central Waterfront, sustainable Portland, private pier dredging, expanding public waterfront access, and sea level rise adaptation a formidable list uh, underscoring how, ta how lucky we are to have Bill serving in this position. Um, what I'd like to do is call them individually to the stage, and without further ado, I would like to first welcome John Henshaw. Thank you, Jack, and uh, good morning, all. I'd have to say that I'm pleased to see so many people here as excited about this uh, topic as I am. And um, it could, bodes well for its future, I hope. Um, so I wanted to talk about the cold storage project we've been working on and uh, more generally about the redevelopment of the um, International Marine Terminal here in Portland. I think we have before us a generational opportunity um, for the city and for the state and um, it's something that I, I hope we're uh, anxious to seize. Um, 
before I get started, I'm going to show a short video of, um, that I think captures the excitement of what we're trying to do down at the um, International Marine Terminal here in Portland. Port, if it's doing anything, is, is creating this dialogue. And now, because of that dialogue, we're stepping off the same old, same old, and we're looking at intermodal. Portland today is a good fit for a transportation logistics hub shipped to rail. Looking at what can happen in Portland, I really think the sky's the limit. Um, the I'm Skip as an anchor is great. Where before you do some of these projects, and it's like, well, what's going to go there? It's like, well, we think we have something going there. There's something there. Shippers need options when they're accessing markets. Adding multimodal transportation options by road, by rail, and by sea is merely accelerating the opportunity for growth. It gives uh, main food and beverage industry access to new markets through the port of Rotterdam, Europe's largest port, to markets all over the world. Um, and with many customers, We've expanded them beyond the traditional markets of the transatlantic into Asia, Latin America and other parts of the world. We have things that we never were able to do before that we can do now and that's across the whole spectrum. 15, 20 years ago it'd be like railroads. Who wants to work for a railroad? It sounds not fun, but it's fun. It's exciting. Every day is a, a new challenge, a new adventure. And the need really wasn't there 10 years ago. So, so now that we're really starting to pay attention to our economic growth, we finally caught up. It's, it's transportation. Freight transportation is as much a factor when it comes to economic growth as is energy, as is labor cost, as is anything else. Transportation matters as much as all other factors when it comes to growing our economy and growing our businesses. So we wanted to uh, share that excitement with the uh, next generation, and to that end, we created a uh, fifth grade education curriculum with the South Portland and Cape Elizabeth school districts called What's in the Box, focused on transportation. It's taught through math, geography, and social sciences. And uh, next year, we uh, look forward to welcoming the Portland School District um, into the program as well. Today, however, I want to talk about uh, what comes next, but first, a little history. Since 2009, our redevelopment of the International Marine Terminal has been guided by listening to Maine businesses. In 2010, with a relatively small $5 million grant to get us started, we were able to turn uh, the derelict mixed-use facility into a dedicated freight facility consistent with the city's plan for the western waterfront. In 2014, we acquired an additional 23 acres to the west of the Casco Bay Bridge to meet the needs of Maine businesses using the terminal. Also in 2014, we brought rail back into the terminal for the first time in 60 years. So our investments in the terminal to date have totaled some $45 million. All of these investments were driven by identified business needs and have shown real-time return on investment. For example, we completed the new rail siding in November of 2014, and by January of 2015, we were loading out 20 rail cars three days a week. I will be spending another $15 million over the next two years to further increase the capacity and productivity of the terminal. In 2013, we brought Aimskip to the terminal. Aimskip focuses on cold storage logistics and is the premier carrier of refrigerated cargo in the North Atlantic. Aimskip offered the state of Maine a unique opportunity through its access to a niche market in the North Atlantic and Northern Europe, serving a population of some 300 million people and providing access to the abundant and sustainable resources of that region. Aimskip is a small shipping line that excels because it's developed a, a successful niche in the refrigerated cargo business. The Port of Portland is also small. Uh, Aimskip's arrival has allowed the port to grow by uh, becoming a niche port that specializes in cold storage logistics and access to North Atlantic markets. We have yet to scratch the surface on the, um, of the opportunities before us. While business opportunities in Iceland continue to grow, other opportunities in the regions beckon. 
We recently sent a delegation to Northern Norway and will host a reciprocal visit this fall. With Ameskip's strengthening relationship with Royal Arctic Lines of Greenland, an entirely new market is open to us. This week, in fact, a group from Maine is exploring business opportunities in Greenland. From there, we can move <coughs> on to other countries in Ameskip's trade network. With Ameskip's presence, we've discovered a cultural affinity with Iceland and other countries of the North Atlanta market it serves. Our efforts have led to exchanges such as the um, four deans visiting us from Reykjavik University today. These relationships benefit our students, businesses, and our community. We continue to grow these relationships in tangible ways. For instance, we have students from Reykjavik University coming this fall to work with Ameskip in Portland, and students from USM going to work with Ameskip in Iceland. This sort of exchange fosters learning through experience and shows what a catalyst for engagement the IMT and its logistics assets have become. Ameskip's interests and Portland's correspond. Even as New England's ground fishery has been in decline, Ameskip carries fish and other products into the New England market to, to feed Portland's processing and distribution businesses. Portland has a real opportunity to grow this niche industry. As all of you know, Portland and Maine have a great brand. Our clean water and air and our access to high quality food and beverage products from our fisheries, aquaculture, farmers, food processors, brewers and distillers creates a unique opportunity to build and grow a sustainable business sector in the food and beverage industry. To grow this opportunity, we need resources businesses, entrepreneurs, transportation infrastructure, and access to markets, both locally and abroad. Uh, we've created a website, foodeconomymaine.com, to highlight this opportunity. Uh, please visit the site when you have an opportunity. To give an example of how uh, Ameskip can help Maine businesses, the Maine Brewers Guild and Ameskip recently announced a partnership to explore uh, new markets for Maine beers. If you hadn't noticed, the beer business is flourishing in Maine with more than uh, 90 breweries in operation. In order to guarantee the continued success of the industry, they need access to new markets. Ameskip provides them with, uh, with those opportunities. And as you can see here, it's not just beer we are sharing, but also Maine produced malt as well. We will be sending a customized container with 50 taps donated by Ameskip to Reykjavik uh, for a Maine beer festival in June and we'll be hosting, hosting a, uh, one featuring Icelandic beers in, here in Portland in July. Who said business development couldn't be fun? <laughs> Ameskip's presence here means something to the port, uh, port of Portland as well. Ship calls in Portland have been in decline for the last decade. In contrast, Ameskip's calls have been increasing from 26 in 2014 to 35 today, and a projected 52 calls or weekly service by 2020. Weekly service should open an, up entirely uh, new opportunities that meet the unique needs of shipper supply chains. There we go. Um, however, in order for Ameskip and the food and beverage industry to grow in Maine, they will need to have access to state-of-the-art cold storage. That is the next building block and the one that allows Maine businesses to scale their business, business to the opportunities. It also keeps those businesses in state rather than having to go elsewhere for cold storage. And it's not only about food and beverage. There are opportunities for pharmaceuticals, biomedical, and other industries we haven't even thought of. To that end, the Maine Port Authority sought to find a cold storage developer that would build a facility on land that we own adjacent to the terminal. Through that pre process, we selected Americold, the world's largest cold storage company, to build the facility. However, because of the small amount of land we have available and the need to have sufficient capacity in the building to make the business viable, Americold proposed a design of some 65 feet that requires a change in zoning to make it possible. As you can see also up in uh, the image here, up in the up left, upper left-hand corner, Ameskip plans to move its US headquarters into the building as well. So the waterfront port development zone where the property is located is currently zoned for a maximum of 45 feet. It was zoned as such in the 1990s when the current uses had not even been uh, contemplated. Much of the surrounding land is zoned at 65 feet. 
For example, Pierce Atwood's building on Mer Merrill's Wharf, which you can see here, is 70 feet tall and once serves, served as a cold storage warehouse. And the new Courtyard Marriott on Commercial Street is 65 feet, not including its HVAC equipment on the roof. For an excellent history of the waterfront zoning process undertaken in the 1990s, I um, recommend you uh, see the audio slideshow uh, titled A Port in Portland at foodeconomymaine.com. The concern that, uh, is that if the zoning is not changed, this opportunity will be lost. I do not want to be the one that carries this message to Aimskip, our local businesses, or even farmers from the county that would use the cold storage facility, because it will be a message that we do not value their continued success. To ensure this does not happen, I'm asking for your support. You have information on tables um, that provides dates for upcoming events. For those seeking more information, the Portland Waterfront Alliance will hold an open house on the project and the zoning change next Tuesday. For those who want to help, the planning board will be holding a workshop next Thursday at 7.30, and we need you to attend and express your support. Bill Needleman, the city's waterfront coordinator, will now talk to you about the process and the zoning issues at hand. I want to thank Bill and the other city staff for their hard work on this issue. The cold storage project is an example of how state and the city can collaborate in economic development. The project will assure that the continued uh, revival of the Port of Portland. It will result in new businesses, new products, new markets that people today can't even imagine. And as I said at the beginning, we believe this to be a generational opportunity for the Port of Portland, one that yields benefits for city residents for decades to come. We must work together to make sure it becomes a reality. Thank you. So I'm just checking to see if my mic is on. Excellent. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you to John for the kind words and for uh, a great introduction to the project uh, that is uh, potentially brewing down on Portland's western waterfront. I'm going to spend a little bit of time giving um, some background and to discuss the current process that the, uh, the, the city's economic development department, the planning department, and, uh, and other folks in city government are undertaking uh, with the collaboration of our neighbors, our planning board, and ultimately our city council. And the green button. The green button. So as John noted, ports are important. Cold storage is important, and the past investments are what create new opportunities for the city of Portland. Um, the goal from city administration is to modernize our port zoning. Now, I'm now in front of a group of about three to 400 people to talk about zoning. Um, apologies. Um, but I've been in this place before, maybe in, usually in smaller rooms. Um, but uh, we do need to get into the weeds every once in a while when we talk about the specifics of land use regulation. And so for that, I uh, ask for your patience. Um, in the city of Portland, our waterfront has been largely divided up into three general areas. On the east, we concentrate our passenger port. This is where Ocean Gateway is, the Casco Bay Island ferries, uh, as well as the Main State Pier. Um, there's also mixed use opportunities that take advantage of that proximity to the downtown. The central waterfront is the home of our fishing fleet, but it's also tourism and the Pierce Atwood building like John showed and other mixed use development in a very tight knit uh, 19th century development form that we're very proud of here in the Portland. But it's very different, especially as you move to the west. And the west is where we concentrate deep water industrial activity and transportation. The western waterfront is the port of Portland. And here we're looking at the specific zone the land use regulation polygon that sits on top of the earth and tells the property owners and the businesses down there how they can conduct business and what can go there, what size it will be. The port development zone extends from the IMT um, all the way to the east at, near the Casco Bay Bridge to the Merrill Marine Terminal and Sprague Energies facility in the west. 
there are very limited number of properties within this particular zone. Uh, the blue polygon you see is the IMT parcel. We throw, we show the potential Americold site in the, in a, with a, a blue rectangle um, located to the west. As you move to the west, there's the new boat yard. The Portland Yacht Services boat yard occupies two lots that are bisected by that new rail siding that John described. Chinbro has a small facility on the, on the western waterfront at Rickers Wharf, and the Merrill Marine Terminal operates a robust bulk and break bulk freight facility um, at the far westerly portion of the site. These new opportunities that John described create new building forms. There are other opportunities as well, some that we understand and know, such as boat repair and boat building, and other opportunities that may come down the line that we don't foresee, we don't know exactly what bulk storage might do for us on the Merrill's Marine Terminal. They move forest products. The forest product industry is in transition. What will they require in the future? Um, we've been working hard with them to understand that, and we also want to put a regulatory framework in place that works for them. So this process is more than just cold storage. It's about modernizing land use regulation for the entire port. While these opportunities are new, the, zo the zoning is old. It was written in the early 1990s um, and has remained static. Uh, there have been a number of changes to the zone, uh, mostly making it smaller uh, and adding one particular use to the zone, which is street vending. Um, it's time to address this zone. Um, the city undertakes zoning processes on a regular basis, and a quick review of the last 10 years shows that the city has changed zoning over 170 times over the last 10 years. And so really, the port development zone uh, has come up in the queue because of these opportunities, and it's time to work on it. The current zoning is also complex. Um, specifically with regards to building height. And this is where we do get down into the weeds, and I'm not gonna ask you to try to understand this complicated graphic, but it shows how different portions of the zone are divided up, and different building height, structure heights are allowed depending on the use. The whole zone is regulated by a 45-foot limit. Bulk storage facilities are limit, are, uh, can range from 145 feet above sea level, not average grade, down to 70 feet or to 45 feet, depending on where you are. This regulatory framework has not generated significant development over the past 25 years that it has been in place. The proposed zoning that is under consideration and will be in front of the planning board for a third workshop on uh, this coming week on uh, the 18th is to raise the base zone from 45 feet high to 50 feet high, very modest. This is to create consistency between the waterfront central zone, that fishing component of the waterfront, with the western waterfront and the port. So everybody gets a smite light bump from 45 to 50, and then potentially up to 75 feet under very specific conditions. And these conditions that are under consideration are that the number of taller buildings would be limited. Essentially, one per lot is what is now, uh, will be in front of the planning board. So only, given that small number of lots, that would be a small number of buildings that could take advantage of that 75-foot provision. Lot coverage currently within the zone is allowed at 100%. You can build out the entire lot. That is now looking to constrict down to as low as 50%, a significant constriction over the existing um, uh, zoning regulatory structure. There would be a simplification of that bulk storage faci uh, facility allowance, and we would cap the top of that of buildings at 75 feet. Currently, a building may be constructed consistent with the 45-foot restriction and be 60 feet tall depending on its roof shape, depending on its mechanicals. The 75-foot limit would be an absolute cap. And there would also be a consideration for design requirements for buildings over 50 feet tall. Zone changes are difficult. We've seen this throughout the city. And neighborhood opposition is understandable. They live here. 
they will be looking at this facility for the entirety of the time that they live in the neighborhood. And many folks have lived in the West End neighborhood for generations. So concerns over traffic, appearance, and the primacy of working waterfront uses as opposed to truck um, transportation are considerable concerns for these folks. Neighbors are also asking for us to justify the need for increased building heights. Do these uses really need to be bigger? Um, and so we have taken these questions seriously and are looking to answer them at both the public forum and with the planning board, but mostly to the neighbors themselves. They've asked legitimate questions about the appearance of structures, the traffic impacts of structures, and the need for structures, and we're looking to answer those questions. First on traffic, we've hired T.Y. Lin, um, a traffic engineering firm, to analyze both recent, to count traffic in the area and analyze the traffic for that area. And they have, they have documented the existing congestion issues. Nobody's saying that West Commercial Street isn't congested at certain periods of time. They've estimated new traffic that will be generated by development generally on the peninsula. They're estimating new traffic that would be generated specifically by the zoning request to go from 45 feet to 75 feet or 70 feet in height. And they've concluded that the zone change itself would not create significant congestion um, or safety issues in the western waterfront. This is an important factor because while congestion may exist within the corridor, will the zoning change make it significantly worse? And so far, the answer has been no. The traffic impacts of the rezoning would be modest. Visual appearance. What will this look like to the neighbors? Um, this uh, image we're seeing from Salem Street uh, shows a, um, a what a 70-foot structure might look like in the approximate location of the Americold site. And so here we're looking at residential structures that would be looking right into the structure. So they, they care about what it looks like. We've analyzed the topography as, a, as a compared to potential building heights in the area. This is an image from back in 2015 when these issues start, first started to brew. And we knew that building height and appearance were going to be important considerations. So we've hired Terry Dewan Associates landscape architects to create 2D and 3D images of existing conditions. What does the topography and the building form look like now? What would the current zoning allow? What would the proposed zoning allow? But then also a likely build out scenario. And that's what we're looking at here as a section drawing through the neighborhood showing the AmeriCole project as pro provided by the Port Authority to the right as related to the existing building forms moving up the West End Hill. This is the first time these images have been shown and I had to squeeze them out of the architects uh, because they're still tweaking these in, in preparation for next week's forums. This is an image that shows uh, portions of the West End neighborhood modeled against topography. It shows the Americold uh, facility um, as proposed, located um, at the bottom of the screen. And then moving up into the west, it shows a series of new developments and existing developments where white boxes would be allowed by current zoning. They are 45 feet or lower. Gray currently exists. And the dark gray would be those structures that would be only permittable under the new zoning proposed. So the Americold site and three structures on the, um, the uh, Portland Yacht Services site, as well as in the far distance, some bulk storage facilities. Here's another look back up at, uh, this is now looking to the east towards the downtown, and you see a couple of those um, the Portland Yacht Services structures. These are structures that were provided by Mr. Sprague at Portland Yacht Services and have been presented to the planning board um, uh, as part of master plan thinking for that site. You'll note that the white box to the far left at the bottom of the screen um, is a significant structure along West Commercial Street. Um, it's currently allowed under existing zoning. 
as was the structure to the far right, which is the boat shed that currently exists. And here is the same type of imagery shown on a Google Earth uh, um, photorealistic, uh, but topographically correct um, model as well. This is going to be much further explored with the planning board on the 18th. From in terms of market demand and economic analysis, um, we have asked Camoyne Associates, a consulting firm, to look at several key questions um, in answer to neighborhood concerns as to whether or not this building and this zoning is um, necessary to bring these opportunities forward. Um, what, is the mar what are the market conditions? What capacity does cold storage reasonably need? And that will impact uh, building size and its pallet and, produ and product volume. Um, what is the proposed building height? Is the proposed building height needed given the lot and market financial conditions? And how important is that waterfront location for the cold storage use specifically? Um, the economic assessment has uh, been undertaken with an analysis of market conditions, interviews with potential users, review of data of comparable facilities on comparable ports, and review of material provided by the main port authority. Their key findings so far, and, and very brief summary, is that there is demand for cold storage in this area. Um, that these facilities are, must be price competitive. Small changes in price have a large impact on whether or not shippers and users will utilize a facility here in Portland or would truck down to the Boston area. Um, and they've also found that the facility proposed is within the average size range uh, for comparable facilities elsewhere. Um, essentially what's being proposed is reasonable. It doesn't mean that it is the only type of facility that could be produced, but as it's moved forward, the economic analysts are not seeing that there's anything out of whack with what's being proposed uh, or, out, um, or out of scale. Explaining the need for taller boat sheds is much easier. Bigger boats need bigger sheds. The city of Belfast, a very small city, has just approved a, uh, recently approved a 65-foot structure at the Front Street shipyard. Um, Mr. Sprague would like very much for Portland Yacht Services to be able to compete on the same scale. And so the, the need for, or the rationale for larger, for larger facilities elsewhere um, in the zone um, is, is easy to explain and it's really a question of whether or not the community wants to accept the, those larger structures to bring opportunities to work on larger vessels here in the Port of Portland. Working waterfront. There is concerns from the neighbors that if the facility is too large that it will be primarily for trucked freight and not for marine freight and that it could be competing with other working waterfront uses. Um, certainly the boat shed and the boat repair facility doesn't face these same uh, questions of support for working waterfront. That on its face is um, you know, clearly a working waterfront use. Um, the image to the right here is a poster from the 1987 referendum on working waterfront uses and a moratorium on non-marine uses. Um, and I think that John's presentation on the port um, I think answers very succinctly and elegantly um, that port activity um, is the heart of our working waterfront use and supports other uses on the waterfront generally like fishing and seafood processing. Um, that the facility would also take trucked freight is a reality that the planning board the neighbors and the city council will need to wrestle with and will continue to ask that question of the relationship between trucked freight and working waterfront. It is a good question to ask, but I think that ports and trucks and are just, they're peanut butter and jelly. Uh, it's, you can't have a port without trucks. You can't have an intermodal facility without accepting the full range of uh, transportation options, um, but 
the city council and the, and the planning board and our neighbors have asked that we explore this important question. Is the expansion of the port for non, that it would include non-marine freight good for the working waterfront or a detraction to the working waterfront? And that's uh, a question that we continue to work with. Working waterfront is important. The recent comprehensive planning process that the planning office has undertaken uh, included a survey which asked the question, should continued preservation for working waterfront be included in city land use regulations? 91% of respondents to that survey answered yes. The working waterfront should not only be um, uh, preserved, it should be protected on, in the city of Portland. And that industry provides opportunities for all Portlanders of all stripes. It is the folks who repair vessels on Hobson's Wharf. It's the guys who drive forklifts on Holyoke Wharf. It's seafood processors. It's these guys fishing for lobsters on Widgery's Wharf. If Portland is to remain a poor community, if we're going to protect our working waterfront uses, if we're going to retain and enhance the city's role as a transportation hub, if we're going to foster employment for the widest possible range of our community, then this conversation is the conversation that we need to have. And I'm looking forward to any questions that we might be able to answer. Thank you. What I'd actually like to do is invite Bill and John to come up and field some questions. Um, at both sides of the room, there are microphones. What I would ask everybody who has a question to do is please make your way to the microphone. Remember, this is being recorded for uh, viewing later on Time Warner Cable. Um, please state your name and, uh, and, and let, the, let the panelists answer your question. So please, thank you. <laughs> and we're still mic'd? Yes, we are. All right. Do we have a question back there? Ah. I, have, <coughs> I have a question. My name is Pete Thaxter, and I'm, <coughs> I'm from Portland. I have a question for Bill, and I thank you, Bill, for setting the stage of what the issues are. I think you understand that the neighborhood is not objecting to the 45-foot height building and that their position <coughs> is that that building can be built economically and well serve the needs of the waterfront. And what they're objecting to is the 75 foot height, which when you see the actual pictures brings it up almost to the level of the bridge. And the necessity for that and the relation of that to the port. And is that fairly stated, Bill, as the, the issue at hand? Uh, so, Mr. Thaxter's question as to you know the the need for the rezoning has been a consistent um, concern of the neighbors. Like, are we asking for more than is necessary? Um, you know, should it be? Uh, there's a different perspective on that. Is like, is this a, a a a use that we're looking to minimize, or is this an opportunity that we're looking to achieve? They are very, they're both relevant perspectives from the neighborhood perspective saying, you know, we, we want cold storage, we want boat sheds, but they should fit within a, a, a visual constraint that is consistent with existing zoning. Um, or are we looking to uh, achieve an opportunity? Um, minimization of harm is what you do when you don't want something. Uh, you know, the opportunity that's come forward with the Port Authority um, asks us to look at it differently uh, which is what, what is going to be best for the port and what is going to be best for uh, the other advantages that that might bring. Um, they're both relevant and important perspectives, and that's why we have a planning board and a city council, is to tease out um, how to approach these, this from a policy direction. Good morning. Uh, my name is Phil Coop. My company is called Revision Energy. And you know, for the past 10 years, I've been listening to the Gulf of Maine Research Institute 
uh, trying to alert us that the Gulf of Maine is the fastest warming body of water on the planet, that ocean acidification is directly impacting our, our shellfish in Casco Bay. And so I did a little research in, online and I went to, uh, to Rotterdam and found that the Klusterbors Delta Marine's cold storage facility has renewable energy all over the, 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 um, the building. And I'm wondering if there's any you know, idea to have sustainable energy be a part of this project, both in reaction to what's going on around us here in southern Maine, and also to maybe um, get a little bit more public support for the project. Thank you. So I, I know that there are other cold storage facilities that do have uh, large solar arrays um, associated with them. Uh, so that is obviously a, a, a potential. Uh, it has not been specifically proposed for this uh, facility today. Uh, I think it would also have implications on uh, the relative size of the facility if you were going to have to put um, additional solar arrays on the roof. Uh, they might be a, they might be a, that might be a positive thing and it might be a negative thing, I'm not sure. Um, but it is certainly something that could be looked at. And I'd, I'd like to add that for the, uh, for the zoning, the, the, the proposed structure is 68 feet. Uh, the zoning is at 75. That's to allow some flexibility on the roof form, um, both for boat sheds and for cold storage, um, so that they could be appropriately pitched, but also could accommodate something like a, a solar panel array. Um, it's just a little bit of flexibility um, that would allow that, that type of opportunity to develop over time. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Eric Weberg. Uh, previously, I believe it was Maine Port Authority issued a request for proposals for design builders of this facility. Um, what is the status of that process right now, and what will be the procurement process going forward for the design and construction of this facility? And if I could add one other question. Um, the, the proposed zoning change uh, actually shows a restriction on potential development of the properties by fewer buildings per lot, so to speak. What's the intent of that? Is that a give and take, or is that something more meaningful to that? So just in terms of where we are in the process, um, back in 2015, we issued an RFQ, or a Request for Qualifications, uh, to the cold storage industry generally, and we've received uh, seven responses, and we qualified all seven of those responders. Uh, and then they were those seven qualified responders were invited to participate in our RFP process. We received two responses to the RFP process, and because of the quality of the proposal that um, Americold put forward, we selected Americold to be the developer of the uh, property. Um, so that's the process that, uh, that we went through. Uh, we were not seeking at that time a building design. We were seeking the most qualified developer we could find because, to be perfectly honest, we don't know a lot about the cold storage business. We wanted to find, bring somebody in that had expertise in that business to build an appropriate um, facility uh, to the market that we're serving uh, on the site. Um, Obviously, uh, Americold, once they looked at the, uh, the site and they looked at the amount of available land we had, uh, also the geometry of bringing rail directly to the cold storage facility, um, that uh, limited the size or footprint of building that they could build on the site. And so that really is what uh, drove their determination that they needed to go up to approximately 65 feet. Um, to, uh, to build a uh, building of sufficient capacity to essentially pay for itself uh, to be economically viable. And so um, in order to do that, uh, it, uh, uh, change in the zoning language is required to make that possible. That's the process we're going through now. Uh, we do have a planning board workshop next week. Hopefully that will be followed not in the not too distant future by a public hearing of the planning board and ultimately a vote of the planning board, which will make a recommendation to the city council. The city council will then vote on uh, whether they want to accept the uh, zoning change or the language change. And then um, at that point, we can go back to Americold and start up the process of uh, developing the property once again. And, and with regards to the um, restrictions that are suggested within the revised zoning, um, we heard loud and clear from the neighbors that West Commercial Street is a gateway 
to our community and that a wall of uninterrupted 70-foot buildings along West Commercial Street would be um, looked at unfavorably both by the neighbors and by the traveling public. Um, we heard that. Um, so that limits on the number of taller buildings are one way to uh, protect against that, what we saw as an unlikely eventuality, but certainly um, was uh, permitted uh, under a 100% lot coverage zone. Um, uh, additionally, the restriction on lot coverage uh, going from 100% lot coverage down to as little as 50% lot coverage, lot coverage <laughs> being how much of the lot is actually covered by a building. Um, it's a significant restriction. But these are developments that are occupying, buildings occupying space within yards. There needs to be circulation and lay down and storage for vehicles and boats. So it should not become overly restrictive, but it again will protect against that uh, worst case scenario of the uninterrupted wall of development along West Commercial Street. Yes. Hi, my name is Kay Mann. I'm with the Maine Green Power Program, and I have two questions. One is, uh, because I've seen projections for sea level rise in Portland area between three and six meters, and I'm wondering whether any um, provision is kind of being incorporated into your plans for the eventuality that that might actually happen. And the second one is a question about whether anyone has considered something like a public art partnership with or arts organizations to um, create site-specific art in c connection to the buildings or on the buildings so that they might become something that the neighborhood would like to look at instead of something they would object to. So um, I'll just touch on sea level rise first and then I can talk to the, to the art portion of the question. But um, so as part of this project, uh, we did have to move uh, Unitil, which is the gas utility in the city of Portland, um, to a new site on the property. And in doing so, obviously, um, utilities are important, and they're very difficult to move, by the way. Um, <laughs> we had to build them a new uh, regulator building that uh, would be sufficiently high above current uh, water levels and projected future levels that it wouldn't be underwater, essentially. And so that is something that we've taken into account, and it will certainly be taken into account as we uh, move forward with the development of this project. With respect to um, uh, the potential for art, it's certainly something we've been talking about. Um, I've heard a number of different interesting proposals. Um, Aimskip uh, uh, at, at one point was talking about um, trying to incorporate some sort of uh, Northern Lights theme. Perhaps when they had Northern Lights happening in Reykjavik, we could have something happening in the building here as well, just to make that connection. Um, so we've had a number of interesting um, discussions about that, but we haven't finalized any plans on that front. In, in regards to sea level rise and uh, uh, the Portland waterfront, uh, we're, we're currently conducting a planning exercise in the Bayside neighborhood, our, our most vulnerable neighborhood, because it's at a lower elevation. Uh, and what we learn in Bayside, we look forward to then applying to the waterfront. The waterfront is at actually a higher elevation than other areas in the city, including Bayside. Um, and um, you know, not to pick on the Poole family from the uh, from Union Wharf, uh, but there is a wonderful anecdote that Charlie Poole, one of the proprietors of Union Wharf, uh, describes of when they were excavating a parking lot on Union Wharf. Um, as they were digging down to do utility work, they found a parking lot. Uh, these facilities will be much easier to adapt over time than many other important infrastructures and neighborhoods within our city. Uh, and certainly, if we were considering sea level rise on the order of six meters, um, we'll have uh, many other challenges to address uh, that will be much more difficult than, than raising the deck level uh, at the International Marine Terminal. Janine? Ladies and gentlemen, this will be the last question. Uh, Janine Carey, president of the Maine International Trade Center. Um, my question is, we work closely, obviously, with exporters around the state of Maine, and uh, a lot of whom are asking for Aimskip's um, weekly service. How important is this cold storage to get on that weekly service that they're shooting for in 2020? 
Right, so when I spoke about the um, increasing number of ship calls uh, that Ameskip is experiencing in Portland, that's driven by market demand. And, um, and Ameskip has been growing at approximately 20% per year. Uh, in order to get to that, that all-important number of 52 calls a year that, or weekly service, this refrigerated um, uh, cold storage facility is going to be key to making that happen because it is um, because this is a core part of Ameskip's business. This is really what makes it possible to get to weekly service, and it is uh, extremely important uh, to uh, to getting to weekly service. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. Appreciate you all for coming. Thank you, Bill and John. Very, very important uh, presentation. And uh, I, I share Bill's uh, uh, apologies for talking about zoning before 9 o'clock in the morning. So um, I do want to say that uh, as a thank you for your presentation, that the chamber will be making a donation to the Center for Grieving Children um, in, in your honor for, uh, for coming here today. I do want to remind everybody that you can always stay up to date by con connecting via Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter, and stay tuned to the Chamber's website for video of this morning's eggs and issues. I also want to call your attention to the call for action. Uh, everyone should have gotten this uh, at their table. Uh, important dates and opportunities for you to learn more or to speak up with, uh, with your thoughts relative to this, this uh, matter. Um, next month, we are pleased to host uh, the governor on June 2nd at Eggs and Issues. Um, that is an event that typically sells out, so I want to encourage everybody to register early, hopefully by May 29th. Um, so uh, I want to thank everybody who came here today and wish you all the best remaining of weeks. <laughs>